Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. You are way bigger, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, and that is who you are, and that is who you are, and that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who Thank you. 
just settle into our hearts today, God. Lord, renew us. We see what's going on, God, but we are your ambassadors, God. We are your light in the darkness because we carry your light, God. So, Lord, renew us, revive us, give us a new vision, and help us to move forward for you, God. When there's darkness, Lord, the light shines bright. So, God, help us to shine bright for you. Maybe you seated as Pastor John comes to bring the word. Praise the Lord. I mean, he's glad to be in his house today. Praise the Lord. Amen. I got about five people. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> let me see that again. How many's how many's glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? All right, there we go. There we go. Praise the Lord. Mm, so good to see you this morning. Um, so good to have you in the house. Uh, so good to have our online family. Uh, I think we're experiencing some video difficulties, So, uh, but we do have audio for them, so thank God for that. Uh, but we are so glad to see you this morning. Praise the Lord. Look at your neighbor and just smile at them. Yeah, just smile real big and real pretty. You say, I'm glad to see you. Oh, that was weak. They must not have been glad to see you. So if anybody told you that, I don't know. Find a neighbor that's glad to see you. <laughs> You're glad to see them and say, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, now, the husband's kicked in right there. I don't know if y'all heard them male voice, but they're like, oh, he done got me in trouble. I better say something here. 
<laughs> Praise the Lord. Mm. So, so good to see you in the house this morning. Uh, we just want to uh, uh, dive right in. Is that all right? You ready for the word? Praise the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's, yes, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and be turning, flipping, scrolling, or just waiting. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 15 this morning. Exodus chapter 15. Praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> mm, I told you we're going to have some uh, uh, different titles than what we had for a few of our uh, uh, in our last series, so uh, I'm just excited about this morning, uh, but we're going to read Exodus chapter 15. I'm going to start reading in verse number 20. The Bible says, then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver, he has hurled into the sea. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Awesome miracle. Awesome. Awesome. For those who not don't know, that was she was singing and, and celebrating the fact that they came through the Red Sea. And the Lord brought them through. And the Lord covered up Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. And they shout and they praise him right there. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Now, <laughs> watch this. <laughs> mm. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in this desert without finding water. So three days. Three days. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. <laughs> so the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? Same people, four verses later. <laughs> We're going to stop the reading right there. Somebody pray for me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for what you've already accomplished in your house. Lord, help us to get out of your way and just let you have your way. Today, we give you honor for what you've already done. And Lord, we just praise you for what you're about to do. Lord, open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to be transformed. Don't let one person leave here today the same as they were when they came in. But Lord, forever change us today through the ministering of your word. And we give you glory for it, for it's in the name of Jesus we ask. And the church says, Amen. praise the Lord. So family, we're in a series that we're calling, I'm Coming Out. <laughs> And in this series, we're looking at the book of Exodus, and I told you last week, we are going to sit here until we're done. Right now, I believe the Lord's going to keep us right here for a couple more weeks before we move forward, but we're going to sit here until he's done in this book for now with us. But today's going to be part two. All right, I got to tell you the title. You ready for the title? <laughs> That's about two of you. Let me find out here. <laughs> are you ready for the title? All right, here we go. I'm glad you said it now. The title for this morning is this, Stinking Thinking. <laughs> Stinking Thinking. Now, as we jump in this morning, i got to start with a statement that I think is going to help us as we navigate through the book of Exodus, and here it is. You don't change your life by changing your life, but you change your life by changing your mind. The first step in getting out of anything is getting your head out. And if you can get your head out, then everything else has got to follow. Hey, if my head comes out, my finances will follow. If my head comes out, my family will follow. If my head comes out, my health will follow. My head has to come out first. I've said this before. Anything that's not born head first is called a breach. That's why God is called the repair of the breach. He wants us to be in proper birth position so when we birth this into this new season, we're going to come out of where we were head first and into what he's got new for us. Oh, if you can get your head out, then, then everything else has got to follow. I got to prophesy to some people this morning and tell you that your head is getting ready to come out. 
oh, I don't know if you received that. And I do get a little nervous whenever I start saying stuff like that because I know there's going to be somebody, whether it be in this house, online, or a hater or a doubter that's going to say, he just says that stuff so he can get a shout. He just does that stuff so he can get an emotional response and get people stirred up. But that ain't the reason why I'm saying it. The reason why I'm telling you your head getting ready to come out is because I have read my Bible. And as I read my Bible, hey, I read where God told Isaiah to tell his people that his word will not return void, but it will accomplish everything he sent it to accomplish. And it prospers the thing wherein he sent it. So when God's speaking a word, God ain't just telling you what he wants you to know. God is announcing to you what he's getting ready to do. God don't talk to you about exits just to be talking about exits. I believe God shows his grace in his timing. So when he's talking to you about exits, then I believe it's your season to make an exit. He's talking to you about exits because he's getting ready to part Red Sea so you can walk right through. He's talking to you about exits so you can march around Jericho walls and they fall so you can walk right through. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but God wants you to walk out of, hey, what you getting ready so you can walk into what you getting ready to walk into. Oh, I'm coming out, church. I'm coming out. I'm coming out of chains that have held me back. I'm coming out of self-imposed prison. I'm coming out of depression. I'm coming out of anxiety. I'm coming out of doubt. I'm coming out of worry. I'm sick and tired of status quo. I'm coming out. Is there anybody else here ready to walk out of some stuff? If I'm talking to you, then somebody help me preach this morning. Who's sick and tired of being sick and tired? Then give your God some praise because God wants to bring you out. Somebody who wants God to do a new thing, give him some praise. Oh, don't call me, I'm out. Don't text me, I'm out. Don't try to bring me back because I'm out. I cried too long to get out to stay in. If you want to stay in, you go ahead and stay on in. But as for me in my house, I'm out. I'm out of old mindsets. I'm out of old attitudes. I'm out of old ways of thinking. I'm out of self-destructive behavior. Oh, somebody help me this morning. I'm out of being taken advantage of. I'm out of being used. I'm out of playing the victim. I'm out of old ways of acting. I'm out of old ways of doing things. I'm out. I ain't confused. <laughs> I might not be out physically. I might not be out relationally. I might not be out financially. I might not be out in this area. I might not be out in that area. But because I'm out in here, because I'm out mentally, everything else is getting ready to come out too. Is there anybody else here who ain't going to wait till you come out to give God some praise? And I'm going to shout because my God is about to bring me out because my mind is out. Mm -hmm. my lord my lord so see powerful statement the quality of our life is dependent on the quality of our mind does that make sense see all through the bible you can see examples that show what i'm trying to say now one of the most popular things and one of the most popular ones that we see where god's talking about this is what paul tells the romans in romans chapter 12 and verse 2 the bible says do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, I ain't transformed by working harder. I ain't transformed by doing more stuff. I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. See, the transform transformation of my life is connected by the renewing of my mind. Now, now, now can I teach for a second here? We, we might go back to shouting here in a minute, but can I teach for just a second here? See, the word renewed means renovate. <laughs> and sometimes a building needs to be renovated to replace old, wore out stuff with new, fresh stuff. See, our mind needs to be renovated to replace old, unhelpful ways of thinking with new, godly thinking patterns. When there's a renovation, there's some things that get upgraded. <laughs> but, when there's other, but then there's other things that get demolished. See, renovation looks messy before it looks beautiful. Doesn't, am I making sense? 
But if you're just willing to survive the messy season, hey, some might be in a messy season right now, but just hold on, church, because if you just hold on, God will bring you into a beautiful season. See, some renovation requires demolition, and there's times that God allows demolition of things on the outside because he's really trying to demolish a way of thinking on the inside. We might be thinking the devil's trying to destroy something on the outside, but God's using what the devil's trying to destroy on the outside to demolish a way of thinking on the inside. In other words, God, God knows that if that wasn't destroyed, then your way of thinking about it wouldn't be demolished. So we had to let some relationships be destroyed so that your way of thinking about relationships could be demolished. He had to let some friendships be destroyed so that your way of thinking about friendships could be destroyed. He had to let some of your thoughts about church and church people be destroyed so that your way of thinking about church and some church folks could be demolished. Oh, is anybody getting this this morning? He had to let you see how, how you used to do and how you used to think about certain stuff could be destroyed so you could step into a new season. Because if he had to let those thought patterns be destroyed, you would have settled for the wilderness. But he ain't called you to be a wilderness walker. He's called you to step into promise. He's called you to cross over into Canaan. <laughs> So what God had to do is he had to demolish some of our ways of thinking. Does that make sense? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, destructive thinking patterns torn down. Now see, and most people stop in Romans 12 too when they get to the part about be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where a lot of people stop. They say, oh, I'm going to be renewed by the transform. I'm going to be renewed by the transforming of my mind. Oh, yeah, and they stop and they shout and they praise. But see, here's the thing. That ain't all Paul said. That ain't where the verse ends. See, Paul goes on to say, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But then there's a real key word. It says, then... You will be able. See, you ain't able until the then. You ain't able until the then. Some people are trying to be able, but they ain't on the other side of the then. And we're like, God, where you at? He's on the other side of the then. Hey, where my blessing at? It's on the other side of the then. Where's my answer at? It's on the other side of the then. Where's my breakthrough at? On the other side of the then. The Bible says then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. But when you have transformation, then the transformation is going to be because you've had a renovation. And the transformation is going to allow you to be a demonstration of all the stuff you say about God. Oh, I don't know if you received that. See, Paul's talking to believers in Rome. And see, at this point in Rome, Christianity is a new religion. And people in Rome are worshiping all kinds of stuff. They got a God for this, a God for that, a God for the other. They got a God for just about anything. So they don't understand some of the things that Paul's telling the believers. So Paul's telling believers that these people need some proof. You got to prove it. You're telling these people that God opens doors no man can shut? Prove it. You saying no weapon form is going to prosper? Prove it. You saying what the enemy meant for good? God going to work it for evil? God going to work it for good? Prove it. See, I just believe that we got some people here at New Day who God getting ready to make a demonstration. See, some people here at New Day have already been in one season or another, and maybe even in this season, you've been a demonstration. You're about to be proof he is who he says he is. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of talking about who God is. I want to demonstrate who God is. Oh, I feel something in the house this morning. I've made up my mind. I'm going to have church. I don't care if anybody wants to have it with me. I'm going to demonstrate who who God is. God is a healer. I'm getting ready to prove it. God answers prayer. You're getting ready to prove it. God makes ways where there seems to be no way. You're about to be proof. God opens doors no man can shut. You're about to prove it. Is anybody going to help me? God breaks chains. Your family member about to prove it. you getting ready to be the proof of who God is. God getting ready to prove some stuff about him. But see, here's the problem. In a lot of spaces and places, the problem is that people are trying to prove to other people things about them. God wants to do some things that ain't meant to prove anything to people about you. He wants to use you to prove some stuff to people about him. 
Oh, is anybody else healing? I'm proof. I'm proof. I'm proof. If you want to know God's a healer, I'm proof. If you want to know God can bring you out, I'm proof. Has anybody else got that testimony or is it just me? If you want to know he still delivers, I'm proof. If you want to know he redeems time, I'm proof. Somebody in here helped me preach this morning. If you want to know how good God is, guess what? I'm proof. If you want to know if you can recover, I'm proof. If you want to know if he can restore, I'm proof. If you want to know he can forgive, I am proof. If you want to know how good God is, just take a look. If you can't look in the mirror, just look right up here. I am proof of the goodness of God. Somebody give him some praise. But see, the entrance into this kind of life where you're proof requires an exit or an exodus out of your Egypt. And remember, Egypt ain't just things that are evil. It's also things that are irrelevant. It's not Egypt's wrong. It's just wrong for me now. <laughs> See, I ain't saying it's wrong. If you like that, then God bless you. Have at it. I don't mind you liking it. You go right on ahead. Go on with your bad self. Enjoy it. You enjoy that. But for me, that's Egypt. Watch this. <laughs> it's something that satisfied a version of me that no longer exists. Mm. <laughs> because uh, my impacts my health. <laughs> What are you saying, John? I'm saying that they were some stuff I used to have an appetite for when I was an inferior version of me. But now that I've leveled up, so has my appetite. And there were some things that satisfied me that no longer satisfied me. And I got to say something powerful, but a lot of people ain't going to like it. Because, see, some people think they got it all figured out. And some people think they've always had it all figured out. And they always had correct interpretation. And they've always had perfect doctrine. And they've always been right. But I got something to say. You show me somebody who's never changed appetites about anything, and I'm going to show you somebody who ain't grown. I don't care what their age is. I don't I don't care how long they've been in church. I don't care how long they've been in the way. Get on up out the way, and it's time to grow up. See, you can suck on a bottle and a pacifier all you want. And when you're little, that's cute. When you're little, that's adorable. But when you're seven years old and still doing it, Parents should, should be able to sympathize here and empathize here. I used to change my kids' diapers. And when they were babies, that's okay. But if they're 20 years old and I'm still changing their diapers, there's a problem. I have grown. That old version of me didn't have boundaries. That old version of me had self-esteem issues. That old version of me didn't realize who I was in Christ. So that old version did stuff. He said stuff. He allowed stuff that he don't allow no more because I'm in a new season and I have grown. See, we got to make a mental exit because Egypt ain't always evil. And I've got to, we've got to drive that home. We've got to see that. Egypt is not always evil. Egypt is also irrelevant. <laughs> see, <laughs> if you're comparing the mindset that God's calling you to have with the mindset that other people have, then you're going to be satisfied, but you're going to be gauging your success based on the stagnation of somebody else. See, just because you're better than others, it don't mean you're growing. It might mean that they stop. If I'm running in a race and somebody gets stuck in quicksand and I pass them, I ain't necessarily faster than them. They just got there first and fell into the quicksand first. Does that make sense? But see, you got to ask yourself, so what I was trying to do with my life?
And you got to ask, what mindset is required for his mission for my life? Not, is it better than somebody else's? Not, is this part of my life better than theirs? Not, am I further along than they are? I got to ask, hey, what mindset is required for the mission you have for me, Lord? See, sometimes leaving a certain mindset <laughs> means that you got to leave other people who had that mindset. <laughs> Because the only thing some of us have in common with some people is talking about and dwelling on a version of us that we don't want to revisit. I just don't want people in my life who share a common past. I want people in my life who have a common future. I love you, but I can't stay here. I love you, but I can't settle for the wilderness when God's got Canaan for me. I don't want to leave you out, but I will leave you behind. And Israel is an example of this. They made a physical exit out of Egypt. They had a location change. But their mentality didn't. In other words, they out of Egypt, but Egypt ain't out of them. So their Egypt, their season of suffering and stagnation, is a season that also shaped their mind in a way that even when they physically came out of Egypt, they survived, but their mind didn't. See, I've taught this before, but Jesus puts it this way in John 10.10. 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And most of the time when we hear that voice, most people focus on the kill and destroy. But Jesus emphasizing calling Satan a thief. He doesn't say the killer comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He don't say the destroyer comes to steal, to kill and destroy. He says the thief. First thing Jesus calls him is a thief. Because what he does most is he steals. And the thing about a good thief is he steals. And you don't even know that you've been stolen from. A good thief will steal something from your past and you don't even know it's gone until you reach for it in your presence. And some of us can also understand this, but a good thief can steal from you. And not only do you know that you've been stolen, not know that you've been stolen from, but sometimes they steal and you don't know where it got stolen. <laughs> I don't know. Anybody, maybe it's just me, but help me out, guys. Am I the only one that's ever bought 10 million hammers? Because <laughs> somebody borrowed it. And you can't even remember when they borrowed it. Now, I'm not saying they're thieves or anything. I'm just saying you, you, somebody borrowed that hammer, and you, and you turn around when you go, well, I need a hammer. So you go look for the hammer. Where's my hammer? What happened? I don't know when it got gone. I don't know what season it got gone. I don't know where it went. I didn't even know it was gone until I needed it now. And see, the problem is, that's what's happened to a lot of people's joy. That's what's happened to a lot of people's peace. That's what's happened to a lot of people's well-being in their mind. Because they go to it, they get in a season where they want joy and they need joy, and they're like, I don't have joy. What happened to it? It got stolen the previous season. It got taken in the previous season. And you can't remember who stole it, where it got stolen, or when it got stolen. Huh. See, some of us have been in Egypt for so long, we don't know what season stole something for us, from us. So when we don't understand that one of the enemy's main attacks is he's a thief, we can be celebrating simply surviving our Egypt. Woo, I made it, praise the Lord. I survived. Glory to God. I'm going to jump up and down. I'm going to high five 20 people. I'm going to clap my hands and shout because I made it through. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we can be shouting about survival and the enemy's like, I didn't send that to kill you. You survived, but your dream didn't. 
You survived, but your attitude didn't. You survived, but your focus didn't. You survived, but your peace didn't. You survived, but your joy didn't because the enemy stole from you. But is there anybody here at New Day who got an attitude with the enemy? Anybody here who's sick and tired of being sick and tired? Anybody else who just done had enough? Is there anybody who's going to tell the devil, you ain't just going to come and steal from me and expect me to sit here and have a pity party? Not today, Satan, and tomorrow ain't looking too good either. I'm going to come and get everything you took from me. I'm going to the enemy's camp and I'm going to take everything God's got for me that he has stolen. I'm going to take back everything he ever took from me. Mm. So they come out of Egypt. But it takes a lot longer for Egypt to come out of them. Just because I'm out of the season doesn't mean that the season's out of me. Just because I'm out of the relationship <laughs> doesn't mean that the relationship's out of me. See, that's why some are so untrusting and so defensive and so critical. Mm. Ooh, I got to say it. Just because I'm out of that church <laughs> doesn't mean that that church is out of me. See, that's why some critical and condemning and point fingers. That's why some are unwilling to commit, unwilling to trust, and unwilling to get connected. See, it's in the text. Because see, Israel just experienced where God uses Moses to convince Pharaoh to let Israel exit out of Egypt. But what I want us to see is something that happened. Because I think sometimes we get so accustomed to a, to a part of the Bible and we tell what happened, but we miss some little minor details. Because, see, the Bible is a living, breathing truth, which means you can read the same passage a million times and get a million different things out of it. So watch this. Exodus 14, 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. And they said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. We lost their services. So the reason they're chasing the Israelites ain't because they want them. The reason they're chasing the Israelites is because they want their services. Because some people don't get a revelation of your value until you're gone. So Pharaoh chases them. And Pharaoh represents whatever's held you hostage, whatever's had you oppressed, or whatever's had you stuck in certain seasons. Pharaoh is habits or behaviors that pursue you. All right, I got to find the honest section. Because some of us can testify that there's times when Pharaoh's chasing me. You think you through with that. You think you over that. You think you over them. You think you're beyond that. And then all of a sudden, look out there, lo and behold, here come Pharaoh again. Because see, new seasons will feel like old seasons. When you're dealing with the same Pharaoh. But God said, Moses, tell the people that even though he's chasing you. Somebody bring me another mic. This is cracking up. <laughs> Moses, tell the people that even though he's chasing you. Thank you. Even though he's chasing you, I'm getting ready to bring this 400-year-old cycle to an end. And the enemy you see today is an enemy that you will see no more. And you get to a point where God knows how to break the cycle and God knows how to break the pattern and God says, your season of fighting that Pharaoh is coming to an end. I ain't saying you ain't ever going to have any more problems, but it's time to stop having that one. It's time to go through that same thing over and over again. It's time to quit crossing that bridge over and over again. It's time to quit going around that hill over and over again. It's time to quit seeing that same rock over and over again it's time to come out the text says the Egyptians are chasing them but watch what happens Exodus 14 19 the Bible says then the angel of God 
who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. <laughs> the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. You missed it, you missed it, you missed it. See, that's the repositioning of the presence of God. See, the angel was in front of them until Pharaoh got behind. And when Pharaoh got behind them, the angel got behind to go in between Pharaoh and Israel. Oh, now if you've had a perfect pass, then be quiet. We'll pray for you. But if you had a perfect past, they, if there's some things in your past that God had to keep from showing back up in your future, then you ought to give God some praise for bitting in between you and your Pharaoh. You ought to give him a shout because he got in between it and wouldn't let the old Pharaoh catch up. He put something in between you so the old Pharaoh couldn't get to you. So the Bible says they get to the Red Sea. And Moses is like, Lord, what are we going to do? And God's like, got you, man. Don't you worry about a thing. I got you. So then in Exodus 14, 21, the Bible says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it. In the dry land, the waters were divided. Now what we need to see there is this, or I needed to see it anyway. All that night. See, I can't speak for nobody else. I was raised in church, church. I was at Sunday school every Sunday. Well, I, I tell people sometimes we had a drug problem. I got drugged to church every time the doors was open. <laughs> But see, I always thought, and I'm not saying it was taught, but I always thought that when God parted the Red Sea, Moses went like this, and the waters went like this. That's what I always thought. Moses stood up, stretched out his staff, and bam, there go the waters. Woof. I saw the movies. I did. I watched all the movies. Every time Moses goes up, he goes, and the water starts. But that ain't what happened. That ain't what happened. See, the Bible teaches us that God took all night part in the sea. So it didn't just turn into dry land instant. All that night... The Bible says the wind was blowing. So the wind was blowing before the waters parted. Oh, see, th this next shout is for all the prophetic praisers. Because the Red Sea in front of you might not be parted yet. But can you praise him because the wind's blowing Oh, Lord, it ain't happened yet, but the wind is blowing. That door ain't open yet, but the wind is blowing. That answer ain't came yet, but the wind is blowing. Oh, I feel like the wind is blowing in my direction. I can't speak for you, but I believe I'm about to step through the Red Sea on dry ground. <laughs> so the Bible says Israel walked through on dry ground, and Pharaoh and his army tried to walk through on dry ground. Israel walked through on dry ground and all they had was feet. <laughs> Pharaoh has horses and chariots. Israel makes it through. Pharaoh should have been able to make it through. Because he got horses and chariots. Israel ain't got what Pharaoh's got. <laughs> but, but they can go where Pharaoh can't go. Because that's the way favor works. 
You ain't got to have a chariot because you got favor. You ain't got to have a horse because you got favor. You ain't got to have what they got because you got favor. And favor sometimes ain't fair. Hey, I ain't griping. I ain't complaining. I'm just saying I can get through on my feet what you can't get through on your horse because I got favor. And sometimes favor ain't fair. Is anybody else in here thankful for favor? Has anybody ever made it through when others were stumbling, griping, grumbling, and complaining, but you walked right on through on dry ground? Because favor makes the difference. So favor, so Pharaoh and his army try to do what Israel did, and the Red Sea collapsed and they drowned. Because you drown when you try to follow a word that God didn't give you. See, that's the problem a lot of people's facing because they tried to step out on a word that God never gave them. See, that's why most churches don't make it past the first year. That's why 50% of marriages end in divorce. That's why some people are head over heels in debt. That's why some ministries don't work out. God never told them to do that. I didn't expect loud there. But it's the truth anyway. Say, how you know? Because I've been there. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so God had just worked this miracle with water. He just parted the Red Sea. And when he get to the other side, they so thankful and they so grateful. You got to remember, these are the million people or more. They pause for a praise break. I mean, they haven't church, church. The Bible told us in Exodus 15, 20, that Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand. Michael, close your ears. She grabbed a tambourine and started beating on that thing. Boy, like she was having church. And then all the women followed her with timbrels and with dancing. They all banging tambourines, singing, praising, dancing, shouting, having them a good time. Woo, the Lord done brought us through the Red Sea. Ain't God good? God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. I mean, they having a celebration because they just had an exodus. They done come out of Egypt. Boy, they having church, church. But then four verses later, Four verses. One, two, three, four. Four verses. That's it. Four verses. They go from celebrating to complaining. They were celebrating how God brought them through the water, but now they're complaining because they ain't had water in three days. And when they run into water, we can't even drink it. So they went to celebrating to complaining in four verses. It took that little bit of time to take their faith. But see, complaining ain't the problem. The complaining is the symptom. It's a symptom of a mind that's been shaped in Egypt. Because they're complaining about water when they just experienced a greater water miracle. They should have known from the Red Sea, God can handle all this water stuff. I ain't got to worry about that. Because if God can part the Red Sea, he can make water be able to be drank. <laughs> but they had a mindset that was shaped in Egypt. And this mind that was shaped in Egypt has got a few traits. And I want to share them with you and then I'm done. So three traits of a mind shaped in Egypt. All right, you ready? Here we go. Number one, short memory. <laughs> short memory. Some people's dealing with this in friends and family. They got a short memory. See, Israel celebrating in verse 20 and complaining in verse 24 because it only took them four verses to forget. Now, if we're being honest right here, a lot of us can see why Moses had an anger issue. <laughs> you're going to sit there and you're going to gripe, grumble, and complain when you still got scars on your back from those Egyptian whips. You're going to talk about how hard the wilderness is when you was a slave in Egypt. <laughs> And some people are complaining about what you ain't doing in verse 24, but they forgot what you did do in verse 20. Complaining about where they are, but forgetting where they were. Israel had a short memory. 
God had just brought them out. Their short memory caused them unnecessary anxiety because what they were facing was small when it's compared to what they've already gone through. So if God can part a Red Sea, he can definitely make water to be able to be drunk. This wasn't nothing compared to what they already been through. This was more irritating and aggravating than anything else compared to the Red Sea. You had an army chasing you down trying to kill you. And God made a way. And now you're going to complain because you ain't got nothing to drink. So, so, so he, here's the question. But how's your God memory? How's your God memory? What are you saying? Have you forgotten that what you're facing now ain't nothing compared to what he done brought you through? What you're facing now ain't even close to where he's brought you from. He's been preparing you for what you're facing right now. Lord, deliver me from short memory. All right, here we go. Traits of a mind shaped in Egypt. Number two, <laughs> suffering mentality. <laughs> they were so used to suffering in their past, they thought it was normal in their present. <laughs> oh, Lord, I got to say something powerful here. Pharaoh made them a victim in Egypt, but they made themselves one in the wilderness. They were so used to suffering, they didn't know how to live without being a victim. So even when they wasn't really a victim, they made themselves a victim because they expected to suffer. Can you enjoy the fruit of God's goodness in your present if you're expecting something to go bad in your future? See, some people's in amazing seasons, but they can't even enjoy it because they're waiting on something to go wrong. They're expecting the bottom to fall out. Well, everything's all right now, but I just know something about to happen. What kind of attitude is that? It's like I want to live on a roller coaster. Everything's going good, and whoo! I told you it was going to go bad. Lord, deliver me from a it's too, too good to be true mentality. Because no matter what, you are good. Even when it ain't. See, some people are dealing with a lot of going good. They expected the last. Well, everything's going good in this relationship so far, but something's going to happen. Well, my marriage is better than it's ever been, but they ain't no way. Gonna keep going. I know him. And him ain't even done nothing. Well, I know how she is. <laughs> ain't no way this can go on. Why not? And then we come to church. God will make a way. He's a way maker. Praise the Lord. Do we believe what we say we believe? We really believe God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. See, God wants us to know that the rest of our life is our season. We ain't just in a season. The rest of your life is a season. I'm going to last. This is going to last. That is going to last. God didn't give them new shoes, but he gave the shoes they had lasting power so they didn't wear out. God will use what he needs to use to keep you in the season that you're in. So if he needs to use a raven to feed you when everybody else is going hungry, he'll use a raven to feed you. He'll use them. If the brook dries up, he got a widow waiting in Zarephath waiting on you to show up and say, bake me a cake. He has got another plan. He is my source. He is not a resource. He is a source. And the same way he did that is the same way he'll do do this. You 
you can't have a lack mentality when you attach to a God who provides. I'm connected to a God who never runs out. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the world and the fullness in it. He does not have a shortage. God will never run out. And as long as I'm connected to him, neither will I. Oh, somebody needed that this morning. As long as I stay connected to my God, I will not run out. Philippians 4.19, my God shall. It don't say he might. It don't say he could. It don't say he's able. He says he shall supply all. Oh, I like that word all. Marty, you'd love that word all too. All means all. It don't mean some. It don't mean part. It don't mean a few. It don't mean a couple. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches. It ain't according to my riches. It ain't according to your riches. It's according to his riches, and he owns it all. But he's going to supply them all by Christ Jesus. And my God is infinite. My God is endless. So if I'm connected to an infinite, endless, limitless God, then I will not run out. All right, number one, short memory. Number two, suffering mentality. Finally, number three, suspicious of Moses. <laughs> See, the pain of Egypt made them so paranoid. Now they wary <laughs> of the one who's been assigned to help them. <laughs> oh. See, this is one of the things that makes church hurt so dangerous. People go through some things in certain places and spaces so they don't allow themselves to open up and connect somewhere else. They're so used to being used, they're so used to being mistreated that they don't know how to manage somebody who don't want nothing from them. Pharaoh had so used and abused them that now they were suspicious of the one God sent to help them that don't really need them. So my question is this. Are you punishing your Moses because of your Pharaoh? Are you punishing the people and the places that God's placed in your life because of Pharaohs you've encountered in your past? <laughs> and Moses is like, I didn't do that. That was Pharaoh. I'm here because I love you and not because I'm using you. I'm here because God sent me here, not because I sent myself. And I know we use a lot of different reasons, we use a lot of different excuses, but here's the question. Who or where are you not letting in this God sent? Huh. Who or where are you creating distance? Stay back. I ain't letting nobody close. I'm never going to get connected like that again. Huh. Who are we doing that with as God sent? What relationship should you be treating differently that you're not because of what happened with Pharaoh? And today, God wants to release you from it. Before you step into the next season of your life, because the Moseses he's placing in your life ain't just there to help you be who you're called to be. They're there to help you build what he's called you to build. What God put in you ain't all in you. Mm. New Day can't be all it's supposed to be without you and 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 you. I can't be all I'm supposed to be without you and you and you and you and you and you and you. What you need to do that God put in you ain't all in you. He put some of that in a Moses. And God will send them. But we need to be ready for them because we're in a season where we ain't got, got time to take Moses through your proof test. You ain't got seven years to figure this out. You're going to have to figure it out spiritually. You're going to have to figure it out quick. God's going to have to talk to you about them and there. And all God is is all that we need. <laughs> uh, that's powerful. If he shows himself in Exodus as the God who delivers and sets us free from what we can't set ourselves free from, then that's a God we need to experience. Sometimes prayer is a strategy. 
Lord, I got my mind stuck by myself, but I can't get it unstuck without you. So very quickly, there's three things we got to do to get our minds unstuck. We got a number one feed. We have to be intentional to feed our mind what lines up with the Bible. Just like your body thrives from what you put in it, so does your mind. <clears throat> and some people are trying to live on fast food spiritual diets. And it's creating some spiritual health issues. See, Jesus used a parable to show us this when he said that when the people were asleep, the enemy came in and sowed tares among the weeds. When we're not aware, seeds are being planted in our mind. And the tares are choking out what God wants to grow because of what it's being fed. We also have to, number two, filter. We have to filter out what's not healthy, not helpful, and not holy. It means we got to be more resistant and have more boundaries when it comes to what's going into your mind, no matter who or where it's coming from. It doesn't always mean to remove relationships, but it does mean sometimes we need to limit certain conversations. Ooh, i got to say something that's going to hit home for a lot of people in this room, including me. See, some people think that they always have to be the shoulder that others lean on. Because they think that they're the only one God can use to help them. Sometimes you're in a season where your faith is weak. So you can't handle people you love who's in seasons of doubt and fear because they start talking about how bad things are for them and they mean well, but you're just in a season where you just can't handle that because it's going to drag you into the same place they're in. You're in a season where you can't hear that and you can't carry that. Come on, musicians. Your faith is too fragile now and you don't need help to be discouraged. All right, number one, feed. Number two, filter. No, finally. Number three, fight. You got to push past indifference and arrest apathy. Because getting and keeping a kingdom mindset requires being intentional. Watch this. Mm, this is powerful. Mentally, you catch sickness, not health. You don't catch health. Health requires being intentional, and health comes from fighting. And when you don't feel like fighting, <laughs> even when I'm losing, I'm going to fight. Even when it hurts, I'm going to fight. Even when I don't see anything happening, I'm going to fight. Even when I'm getting attacked from every side, I'm going to fight. Fight. You can't stay here mentally. Fight. You can't stay here emotionally. Fight. You can't stay here spiritually. And today, I'm going to pray that God gives you the grace to fight. Stand. I need everybody praying because now it's time to fight. There's people in this room who's fighting. And they're fighting for their very lives. They're fighting for their family. They're fighting for their kids. They're fighting for their grandkids. They're fighting for their marriage. They're fighting for their self. And if we're honest, we're all fighting something. And I need to tell you today, don't give up. Don't you dare quit. The enemy thinks you are just trying to tell you and make you think that you ain't going to win. But I want you to know that not only are you, you going to win, your testimony is going to help bring somebody else out of the very thing that you're facing right now. Don't quit. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare quit. So I want to pray for you, but I can't pray for you. So I'm going to pray a short prayer, and I'm going to invite you to come to the altar. We'll make sure there's people up here to help you fight. They'll stand with you, but I need you to fight.
because we can't fight for you. But I need to know I'm praying for so if I'm talking to you this morning, <clears throat> slip your hand up and say, pray for me. Pray for me. Hands going up all over the building. I'm fighting for my finances. Pray for me. I'm fighting for my family. Pray for me. I'm fighting for my marriage. Pray for me. I'm fighting for my mind. Pray for me. Your presence, fight. The enemy don't want you to walk in. 